Well, good morning. Everybody stand up. Everybody look at your neighbor next to you and say, you look pretty good today. Tell them an hour and a half from now, you'll be at the barbecue and you'll look a whole lot better. No, okay. No, just stay standing because I want to ask a few questions. I would assume that the majority of us in this room today are believers. But before I introduce, I want to thank you for Pastor Travis for hosting us. It is a joy to be here. I really like the atmosphere that's here, because what I'm talking about is going to be atmosphere in a few moments. But I want to ask you a few questions while you're standing, just to observe, to see if this is going to be for you. Is there anybody in this here room that's had disappointment after disappointment? You get through one thing, and it seems like right around the corner, there's something else. Just like the writer says in Proverbs 13, 12, unrelenting, without stopping, disappointments, they make the heart sick, but a sudden good break turns things around. Anybody here can relate a little bit with that? Okay. Is there anybody here that just felt the presence of God? You know, you, you, you experienced it at one time, two times, three times in your life or in worship. But you know that there's something else that God's trying to pull you up into, just another dimension to Him. Come on now. Okay. Is there anybody here that's ever sowed? And you've sowed and you sowed and you know that you were obedient to the voice of God, but you haven't seen the return come in like you know that it's supposed to come in. And yet the word is true. We know that. And then here's another one. Let me ask you. Has anybody ever prayed and cried out to God? And you know that you connected with God, but it didn't happen. You haven't seen the deliverance. You haven't seen the answer. Can anybody relate a little bit? Or how about this one? A prophetic word came forth. And when you heard that prophetic word, it burned and resonated on the inside of you in a dimension that is way beyond anything in the natural. Because you knew that you knew that you knew that the voice of God was speaking to you. And here you are now years later, maybe even decades later, maybe even three decades later. Yesterday, a prophetic word from years back was fulfilled yesterday. And one of our greatest opponents in the city, actually greatest, would be on the news, get my tapes from Sunday morning, and then he would play them on the, uh, he would speak against everything I did on Saturday night. I sent him a thousand dollar offering just to bless him, because the Bible says, blessed are you when men speak evil against you, falsely for my name, say great your reward in heaven, amen. So if they laid up a biggie, I want to thank them. Okay, yesterday I we had the opportunity to speak at one of their churches yesterday. And it's just how God has changed things. 30 years, 30 years, and just keeping on sowing, and we saw the breakthrough. Can you all say amen? Now, if any of the areas that I spoke to you resonated in you, raise your hand. If more than one resonated, hit both hands. Come on. Okay, tell your neighbor this one's for you. All right, you can be seated. Amen. Crossroads. I'm excited to be here, Pastor. Thank you for the great job you did in laying the fountain. I'm in the same boat that you're in right now. My son is taking over our church. In the fall of this year, we're going to actually transfer the mantle over to him. He's been speaking now. We've been in a five-year plan, and we're right at the end of that plan now. So it's a, big, it's, it's, it's a big challenge for us, but yet we believe it's the voice of God that's prompted us to do that. Amen? In the book of Colossians, if everybody can say Colossians. Let's turn over there, if we will, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse number 1. We're just going to read this. I want you to go together. Come on, everybody say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By what? Now, let me just ask you a question right now. How many know the most important subject in the Word of God, to me anyway, is being not in the outer parameters of the will of God, but being in the very center of the will of God? How many know everything in the kingdom will operate when we're in the center of the will of God? Outside of the will of God, how many know things aren't going to go well for you? But how many know in the center of the will of God, no matter what the challenges or storms that come against your life, how many know that when you're in the center of the will of God, you know that God is for you, you know that God is good, you know that God is on your side, and you know that this too is going to pass, and there's something good the enemy's been holding back on the other side. So I've understood this here, but the word will is actually brought out 3,418 times in the scripture. It is the most important, it is the most talked about subject in the entire word of God. You won't see another biblical doctrine that has 3,418 uh, different references to it in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it speaks about the will, and it speaks another 568 times. And then he uses the word willing, God's not willing 
willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Scriptures that we're very familiar with. And you'll see another 32 references. I'm saying all that because you add it up. The most important thing for Paul, the most important thing for me, and the most important thing for all of us as believers is not to be in the outer parameters of the will of God, but to be in the center of the will of God. How many want to be in the center of the will of God? So Paul says this. There was even an, uh, an intercessor in the church at Callus that actually is, if you can look this up later in the book of Colossians chapter 4, 12. It says Epaphras was an intercessor, one that prayed for them that they would be complete, come on, and not just some, that they would be perfect and that they would be complete in all the will of God. So there was somebody that was inside of that church that was interceding for them that that church would be complete and they would be mature in not some of the will of God, but in all the will of God. So how many know if that's in the Bible, how many know it's important for you and I? How many know the one that is not our, our father, our mother, our brother, our sister is not the one that is in the natural, but how many know it's the one that's in the spiritual that does the will of God? And so I can go on and develop that whole aspect of it, but for time's sake, let's go to verse number two, okay? Go for, to the saints and faithful brethren, come on, in Christ who are at college, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number three. We give, come on. Thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying on. Now, isn't it amazing that in all of Paul's epistles, all of them, except for one, and that's Galatians, in all of Paul's epistles, within the first chapter somewhere, he always makes reference about thanksgiving to God. When that jumped off the page, you can look it up in 1 Corinthians, you can look it up in 2 Corinthians, you can look it up in Ephesians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, you can even go into Timothy and see it over there. But in, in all of his epistles, he makes a statement over there, we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Those words jumped out at me many years ago when I heard the voice of God when I woke up one morning. And he said, Rick, the highest expression of faith in the Bible is gratitude. And when I heard God say that, I said, God, I need chapter and I need verse on that. It says, Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. You can look up the word glory, and it literally means bringing an offering of gratitude to God himself. And Abraham's faith expounded. Abraham's faith just went way out there. And so we recognize that in every situation in life, thanksgiving sanctifies the atmosphere for the purpose and the plan of God to take place. Outside of gratitude, how many know you're not going to have, listen very carefully, outside of gratitude, you're going to have something else, and it's not going to be in the center of the will of God, but it's going to be hell's best for your life. And how many know God doesn't want you to have hell's best, he wants you to have heaven's best. So in there, so the purpose in the writing of this here, isn't it amazing? He goes on in Colossians, and he says, I want you to be abounding. I want you to be overflowing with thanksgiving. He said there was another one that said that they were devoted to prayer, Colossians 4, 2, devoted to prayer and thanksgiving. They had a devotion to prayer, but they also had a devotion to thanksgiving because everything we're going to accomplish is going to be done when gratitude sanctifies the atmosphere. Now, let me just state this ahead of time before we go anything. How many know God can do anything? How many know God's the Almighty? He can do anything. See, that's the greatest problem that the church in Canada has today. Because we say God can do anything, but the reality is there's things that God can do and there's things that God can't do. There's atmospheres that God wants to come in and there's other atmospheres that God can't come into. Remember in the book of Mark chapter 6 and Matthew 12, it said Jesus could there do no mighty works. It's not that he didn't want to do them. He couldn't be do them because the atmosphere wasn't right. In the same respect, what I have recognized in the whole kingdom of God, I've seen cutting-edge churches. I've seen cutting-edge churches that were flourishing, that were abounding. And then something hit those churches. Something started hitting them. Something started attacking them. And it started in a very, very small, subtle way. And it was rooted in a spirit of discontentment. And that discontentment started stirring up tongues that began to talk and began to wag. Come on. Now, all I can tell you is this. This is all I know about Crossroads. It's a good church. It's a generational church. And people are happy. 
How many can say that's a good report about your church? So I am not aware of any issues. I'm not aware of any problems. But being in the ministry now for 43 years, I recognize when things are going well, the enemy is also up to something. And hopefully by the grace of God, we're going to abort everything that hell has and establish everything that heaven has. Okay, so let's go on. Now look at why he's giving thanks to this church. Look at the next verse. We're going to go very quickly down to verse number four. Everybody read it. Come on. Your faith in Christ Jesus and of your... Let me ask you a question. Anybody here got faith? Come on. Anybody here got love? Anybody here, listen very carefully, loving the brethren? Okay, keep going. Go to the next verse. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now look at this next verse. Which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is what? Bringing forth fruit as it also is among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in you. So in other words, listen carefully. This is a church already operating in faith. This is a church already operating in love. This is a church, listen very carefully, that's loving one another. How many know it's the love of God of the Father that's drawing men, drawing women to the house here? And so, but look what happens over here. Go to the next verse. Come on. Oh, glory. Come on. As you learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister on Christ on your behalf. Now, how many know that not only in the house was her faith, not only in the house was her love, not only in the house was her love of the brethren, not only in the house were they fruitful, not only was it being talked about in the known world of that day, but they had faithful men and women. I met some of them this morning when I came in. Just went right to the scene, jumped right up. Uh, the place we're staying, faithfulness, you can see it in the atmosphere. You can see it in the people. They, they, they are not just spectators. They're participants in the whole thing. Everybody turn around and say, we bless our sound men. Amen. Why do I say that? Because the only time you ever look around to them is when they're screeching in the sound sometimes. Okay. So anyway, so you got faithful men and faithful women in the house. Now look at verse number eight. I love this one here. Come on. It says, who also declared to us your what? Love in the spirit. So when the intercessors are decreeing there's love in the people, how many know you're doing really good? Now look at verse number nine. This is what caught me. For this reason, okay, hang on. For this reason, we also, wait a minute. Another translation says, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, what is it that they heard? There's nothing but good that he just rehearsed. Everything is going well. Everything is on the up. They're on the cutting edge. They're moving forward. Souls are being won. People are being baptized in the spirit. God's kingdom is advancing and God's kingdom is moving forward and everybody said. But there's a tendency when things are going well to let down. And so he says for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you. Are you with me right now? So what does that mean? I've seen the church go through cycles over the years. I've seen cycles where it's really hard plowing. I've seen cycles, man, where it's just difficult. I've seen cycles like it says, is this, what is happening, God? Like, like the, we're, we're seeing a trickle of souls come in, but not what you have promised us. God, I don't understand it. And I've seen season like that, that the laboring was very, very difficult. It was very hard, amen? But then there's other seasons. It's just like, it's like a, you're on a, a, on a water slide, man. You're moving so fast, come on, and refreshing, and the waves are hitting, and, and it's just good. How many know what I'm talking about? So notice what he said for this reason, because things are going well. Everybody stand up for a moment and say, he's talking about crossroads. <laughs> Tell him it again. He's talking about our church. <laughs> amen, because things are well today. Can you say amen? Okay, go ahead and be seated. So for this cause, notice what he says. For this reason, since the day we heard it, I do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be, come on, filled with the knowledge of his will, come on, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the writer comes in now, and he says, listen, the number one thing I want, and I want the intercessors to pray, the number one thing I want you to pray for your pastor, the number one thing I want you to pray for the congregation of Crossroads, is that, that we would what? Be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now the best way that I could describe that is has anybody ever been to a buffet? 
Okay. And how many know there's two ways to pronounce buffet? One is called buffet and another is called buffet. Okay. And how many know, how many have ever buffeted their body at a buffet? What does it mean when you buffeted your body at a buffet? That means you stuffed yourself to the guilt and there was no more room for anything and you actually came to a place of being uncomfortable. Amen. Let me tell you, my concern for our nation today is that many believers are comfortable today. My concern for the believers today in the nation is the freedoms that we have are being eroded right before our very eyes. And Christians don't even go out and vote. My concern, listen very carefully, is we vote more because of the dollar than we do about the what's right and what's wrong today that's going to affect the children and the grandchildren, the generations to come today. So Paul writes out there, and he said, I don't want you just to have the filled with the knowledge of my will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I want you to be stuffed to the place where that will is in the forefront of your life. It's in the very center of your life. It's in your waking moment. It's in your closing moment at night that you're in the center of the will of God. Now, can everybody agree? Okay, now let's go and get started with the message and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll get started now. Now that was my introduction, okay? In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 16, this is one of them favorite verses. How many have ever had a day when it just seems like all hell is breaking loose? Anybody ever have that? How many know the Bible has them days? And the Bible calls it the evil day. Okay, if the Bible actually says, that having done all to stand, stand, uh, put the whole armor of God on that you may stand in the evil day. The evil day is a strategic day. It's a planned day for hell to come against you, to knock out your marriage, to knock out your family, knock out your kids, knock out your finances, knock out your health. It's, it's an evil day that's zeroed in. But how many know in the evil day when it hits, how many know we need to be prepared beforehand for that evil day, not afterwards? And so a lot of people, they're trying to get an insurance policy on their house when the house is already burning up. And so the reality is the Bible says rejoice. Come on now. Always. So what does that mean? The simple interpretation is that not because you feel like it or not because you don't feel like it. Rejoice always. How many know David had the understanding of that? He said, I will bless the Lord. Come on at all times. All means every, the whole. At all times means all seasons of life. And if you read through the books of Samuel and you read the life of David, you'll see that he had many, many different storms, many, many different adversities, many different attacks. But he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, his tahila, his praise, literally offering of gratitude shall continually be in my mouth. So David had the understanding of that. Then you'll see unity, then you'll see humility, and then you'll see all the promises of God that took place. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from, come on, all my fears. Many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivereth them out of the, uh, out of them all. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them and delivereth them from all their fears. How many know all the promises from verse number 5 all the way to verse 28 are all there in Ephesians, come on, excuse me, in Psalm 34, but how many know that if you're not honoring God, you're not blessing God at all seasons and at all times, the rest isn't going to happen in your life. Example of that, a year, two and a half years ago, I went through one of the greatest challenges in my personal life in the church. And we have a piece of property that is on the front of, it's a right on Walker Road in the main area in 7th Concession. And we have a contract that's signed by our city officials. It's signed. And this contract was 12 years before. And this contract came up into City Hall, and there was a piece of acreage that we wanted to sell that we already had a cash offer on for $1.6 million. Understanding we bought 50 acres 30-some years ago for $180,000. And so anyway, the property has increased. We're now right in the very heart of the city. And, and, And in City Hall, there was a number that was played against our church where we heard this publicly across the air. The church is just in it for a money grab. Publicly, on on the A channel and everything else. And I'm like, why are they saying, why are they doing this here? Okay? And then, then, then on top of that, a ringer comes in. In other words, a person that's perjured and came under oath 
and made this story sound like we can't sell my mom and dad's house and they're in their 80s and they, they want to move out and they got this old farmhouse but they can't sell it because of you and that's me on the front row. And I'm like, what the heck is this all about? What is going on? It's one of them evil days. Come on. And then here I am right in the middle of all the storms. Here I am right in the middle of the adversity and all this is going on, okay? And then they vote against what the leaders of the city had already given me their handshake for. And I'm like, I don't believe this is happening. I don't believe this is happening. So, so uh, the news came to me afterwards and all the media comes to me afterwards. And, and I said, no, listen, this, this is our spokeswoman for the church. See her. She'll take care of any uh, interviews or anything. You know, I'm out of here. And, and literally, I walked out. I got in my car and I just broke. And I was shamed. I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. So the next day, I called a real estate agent and I said, listen, find out where that home is of that woman that she said about her parents and go buy it, put it on my personal line of credit. I said, just buy the house and, and I'll pay for the thing cash and then we'll sell it. We'll turn it over in a few years, whatever. Just go and buy that house. The next day, she calls in, but she doesn't get the woman that represented her, the daughter. She actually got right to the homeowner and Googled it because there's only one house on 8th Concession. And Googled it and got right to the parents, got the number, and called the parents. And the mother answers the phone and says, who told you that our house is for sale? Our house is not for sale. And they use that to sway city council. So anyway, how many know it's easy to preach, rejoice always? But how many know when you're shamed, you're publicly humiliated, how many know it's not always the easiest thing to do? Amen? we got to use our faith just like everybody else needs to use their faith. And in this situation, man, Kathy can tell you, I got discouraged. I got, you know, how many know it's one thing if you're embarrassed, but it's another thing when you're publicly humiliated. And WCF has had an incredible name within the community for over 35 years. And so anyway, to make a long story short, after the dust settled, and after, you know, I got out of my pity party, and afterwards I got to God, and I just said, okay, God, what's, what's this all about? And he said, practice what you preach. Go to chapter 4 in your book. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And as soon as he said that, I knew. And it wasn't the book Secret of Kingdom Life. It was my book, The Five Tests of Faith. And one of the tests of faith is divine delays about demonic delays and godly delays. Okay, are you all there? And so anyway, how many know there's some things God holds back? And there's other things, listen, very, the devil holds back. But when he's telling me this wasn't a demonic delay, this was a, a godly delay. And after I got that, you know, how many know I'm stressing? How many know I'm, 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 I'm embarrassed? How many know I'm feeling this your way? But how many know God's not sweating anything? How many know God's under control, amen? And so anyway, to make a long story short, two and a half years go by, and I get this here, you know, go back to your book and look what it says. And I look today, if we would have sold the property for 1.6, that area has just excelled, and, and a new mega hospital's coming up. Uh, it's the super hospital that you've probably heard about for Sarnia. It's going to be for Chatham, for Windsor, for Amherstburg. All those areas is all amalgamated, coming into one huge super hospital, and it's just a mile and a half from our property. And so now that not only has it increased, it's just going crazy now, the real estate market. Okay, and so if we would have sold it for 1.6, today we could get at least 3 million for that. Can you say amen? So sometimes it's easier to practice, listen very carefully, rejoice always when you don't. Now go to the next verse because I'm almost ready to start, okay? Rejoice. I got to let you go to the barbecue at 1230, okay? So rejoice always. Everybody say rejoice. Okay, and then number two, pray without, come on, ceasing. In other words, always be in an attitude of prayer. How many know that doesn't mean you got to publicly be speaking out loud, the Shundais, the Hundais when you're at work? But how many know you can always stay in an attitude of prayer? And then he says the key. Look at here now. It says, come on, in everything. Everybody say it. Come on. In everything. NIV says in every circumstance, in everything that comes your way. What does he say? Give thanks, for this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you. And it's not just speaking to preachers. It's not just speaking to five folk. It's speaking to every one of us in the room. In this, he says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
So in other words, God says, listen, no matter what hell will bring, I got the ammunition, I got a surprise attack, I got a suddenly waiting for you that can turn things around for your life, for your marriage, for your finances, for your home. But I need an atmosphere and I need a consent from you to bring gratitude so the purposes of God can be fulfilled. Are we all there? Now how many in every circumstance of life have given God thanks? How many said, I missed it in that one, PR? Come on, raise your hand. I want a testimony. Let's go. No. One day, before I go any further, most of us, including Rick Shimatero, stop at verse number 18. And that's it. You hear that preached? And that's it. But the next verse gives us revelation and gives us understanding of why God says in everything to give thanks. Come on. Go to the next verse. Do not, come on, quench the spirit. So apparently, apparently from the scriptures, ungratefulness, ingratitude, come on, not giving God thanks in every situation quenches the spirit. Don't try to take a scripture out of its setting and then preach it Take the scriptures within its setting. The context is in everything. Give thanks for this is God's will for you. And then he says, do not quench the spirit. Now what that word quench means, are you ready? It means the spirit is on standby. The spirit is ready. The spirit is active. The spirit is moving. The spirit is charged. The spirit is burning on the inside. But every time we become ungrateful... We literally quench the spirit. It literally means, Pastor Travis, to block the airwaves. And as a former asthmatic, any asthmatics in here? Okay, raise your hand. Okay, guys, what happens when you get the hot weather into the cold weather? What happens? It just tightens up. Yeah, it tightens up, right? And what happens? You're going, ah, come on. Okay, and you wheeze because the air is struggling to get through. That's exactly what happens in the spirit realm. It literally says this. It literally says this. It literally says quench means restrain the spirit. In other words, you are putting clamps on God every time we get in ungratitude. And we oftentimes just do it every day. We complain about gas going up. Hey, listen, you complain about $1.30? Go to Vancouver. I just paid $1.59 a month ago. Can you say amen? Go to Europe. I was paying $7 a gallon four years ago. And so you want to complain about it, just put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Come on. And then what do we do? We complain about the government. We complain about the policies. We complain about our husband. We complain about our wife. We complain about the worship. It's too long. It's too short. It's too soft. Why they got to play that song? Why they got to sing it over? Why they got to do this? And we don't even realize inside of our lives what is actually going up because ingratitude is the release of a perverted spirit. Romans chapter 1 says, neither were they thankful, and God gave them over. Come on. They came over to a perverse spirit because it was a spirit of ingratitude that was released into the atmosphere. As a matter of fact, I've recognized that gratitude releases a spiritual abortion to every good thing God has for your life. Are you there? As a matter of fact, I got this written down. Is anybody getting anything out of this? Everybody stand up for just a moment. I love doing this. Okay. Everybody say this here. Ingratitude is a spiritual abortion for every good thing that God has in your life. Okay. Now, how many are married here? Well, you know what? You know that wife of mine or that husband of mine? Come on. How many know you're aborting every good thing that God has for you? Are you there? Oh, that went over very, very well. Okay. And then you hear the song, We lost that love and feeling. Oh, that love and feeling. Come on. Okay. Number two. Are you ready? Ingratitude is a paralyzing force that ruins and destroys marriages, families, churches, and relationship 
and immobilizes or paralyzes the thrust of the vision. Now, you can be seated. I've worked in churches long enough for 43 years with boards, and it only takes one discontented board member that comes in there to the pastor and just, just dumps all his cold waters and dumps all the stuff. And I don't know anything about your church, so just hang in there. Can you all say amen? amen? But every time you get fresh vision, every time you get fresh passion, they want to do it like we used to do it 50 years ago. <laughs> they want to control. They want to stifle. They want to water it down. And they're always characterized by, yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. It's always there. A conjunctive verb. Yeah, but. But we can't do this. We don't have the money. But we can't do this. We don't have the power. We don't, can't do this. We don't have enough people. We can't do this. And you hear all the can'ts, and you hear all the would'ves, and all the could'ves, and all the should'ves, and all the reasons why. And then what happens? You smother the spirit, and then the thing just dies, and it starts from the cutting edge going this way. It starts staying this way, and then it starts going that way. Now, I'm speaking from experience from 43 years traveling the nation, speaking almost 300 times a year. So I think learning and seeing things firsthand, I know a little bit about the subject. It also is a malignant tumor that literally stucks the life out of the health tissues of the body of Christ, and it zaps the life, zaps the passion, and zaps the love out of its victims. It, ingratitude causes traumatic experiences from all that it's shared with its venom. It feeds spiritual cancerous tumors and literally sucks the life, the purpose, and the dreams of people. Come on. Ingratitude will kill, stifle, and smother any kind of growth in a Christian church or in a ministry. And ingratitude, now listen to this. Listen. Why does the Bible say in the New Testament... To do all things without murmuring and complaining. Okay. How many know one of the things that I'm called to do is to love my wife? Okay. But how many know if I murmur and complain about it, how many know I ain't doing very good? And what I've recognized, Pastor Travis, listen to this one. Listen to this here. How many believe from our faith background that words are powerful in the spiritual realm? Come on. How many of them? Anybody ever say, that kid's a pain in the neck? That kid's a pain in the butt? Come on. Just raise your hand. And then you wonder why you got to go to shoppers and get your preparation H every week. <laughs> because you've been speaking it out. That kid's a pain in the butt. That kid's, come on. Or that boss of mine's a pain. That kid of mine's a this. And then you wonder why you got hemorrhoids. Creative power of your words. <laughs> now, you might laugh, but it's true. Come on. And, and, and how many know the Bible speaks about what we, we can have, what we say? I, I'm amazed at how many preachers speak against people and confession, how it brings possession. And all the things that the Bible said, said, let the weak say that I am strong. Come on. There's power in our words out there. And so let me just give you an example of the power in the words. Uh, my wife is a woman that likes ambience. So at this B&B that we're at, they got nice ambience in there. It's clean as a whistle. The food's amazing. The decoration's amazing. The towels look like they've never, ever even been washed before because they're brand new. Okay, everything is just amazing. She likes ambience. And so we have a restaurant in the city of Windsor. It's called Spago's. And Spago's a great Italian. I'm Italian. I'm actually Sicilian. But I, I like Italian food, okay? So he goes to this restaurant, and it's, it's one of Kathy's favorites in the whole city. And it's where they got the ambience, you know. They had the upstairs where the waiters come, and they, and they have the towels, and they put them over their hand, and they fill your water every 30 seconds. And it's just smiling at you, and they're just perfectly set and perfectly timed. If your bread's down, they'll come and fill the bread. And we like it with the oil and with the oregano and all the stuff that they put in in the spice. And then you dip your bread in there. And, man, it's like a third, uh, third level of, uh, of anointing for me. Amen? Okay. And so here we are, and we're having one of them six-star nights. Everything is perfect. We're not talking. We have a, a, an agreement that we've made that we're not going to talk shop. Okay, in other words, because how many know with churches and the larger church gets, the more problems you have. And so you find out that the most of the things you're discussing oftentimes is problem solving. Matter of fact, Channel 7 Action News across the river had a position for the problem solver to come. And man, I, I was tempted to go and I said, I could do that job. 
okay? Because I got a little bit I know about that there. But anyway, I'm saying all that. The night was perfect. Everything was perfect. I'm looking into her big brown eyes, and I'm, hmm, and I'm singing that song. Tonight's going to be a good night. The Black Eyed Peace song. Come on. And I'm just looking. I mean, come on. You can't be real in church. It's okay to talk this way. So anyway, that night, so everything is perfect. The food is outstanding. The, 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 the owners come over to our table and always just say hi to us, and they always want to send us extra appetizers and things. And it's just, just a great, great place that we just enjoy, and we're having a great night. And then the bill comes. And they just put it down on the table, and I opened it up. And I made a little complaint. It's just a little thing. That, how, many, how many of you ever had a little complaint? Come on. Come on, just a little one. Just Nobody in here has ever had a little complaint? Okay, how many have had a big complaint? Okay, all the hands go up for the big one. Well, I mean, this is a little complaint. Okay, and then as soon as that little complaint came up, I'm looking at my brown-eyed girl, and I said, what's up? And she said, nothing. How many have learned... How many men have learned, if you haven't, okay, you're going to get elbowed, okay? That when a woman says nothing, there's something, but she ain't going to tell you because it's like tongues and interpretation. Okay, something's going on, but you just don't know what it is that's going on. Okay, and so what is going on, amen? And I didn't even realize it, that when that came out, I literally shut my wife down by that complaint. And it was just so minor and so simple that it just shut her down. And in her mind, it's like, oh, well, he's complaining about the meal. Okay. So, I mean, God's provided for the God's provided. We can go to a nice place. And so we come home that night, and she just went on to do whatever she had to do, but it wasn't a black eyed pea night. Okay. And so she went her way, and then I just went in the study. And it actually birthed this here book. It was one of the main events that birthed this book. And God began to download to me, and he said, Rick, he said, walk through the night. Everything was perfect. I blessed you with the finances that you can take your wife out to a nice restaurant. I provided for you that you can do this here. You had a great meal. She, she's just the most gorgeous thing to me. Come on. Everything was perfect. Uh, the conversation was perfect. And as soon as I let out that murmur, come on, it just shut her down. And the Holy Spirit said this to me. Listen carefully. I don't use the God card often. You can ask my kids in church. I don't say God said every two minutes this and that. I, I, I believe being led by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit quickened me that day and said, this is what my people to do to me all the time. And I'm like, God. He says, they cry out. They pray. They seek my face. They're, 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 they're praying. They're saying all the right words. They got the confession right. But he said that murmuring is going on inside of their life. And so I had to examine my life. And then I said, okay, God. And he took me to Jonah. And it says Jonah prayed. Jonah cried out to God. And it even says in the Bible, God heard him. Okay, so God, God connected with him. It says the same thing in 1 John chapter 5. The only difference is God answers in 1 John 5. And so he goes and he prays and he cries. And isn't it amazing what was his main problem? He complained about the assignment God gave him. Come on. I'll say it again. He complained about the assignment God gave him. Go to Nineveh. And guess what happened out there? He complained and it aborted, listen very carefully, for that time. How many know it would have been easier to go the way God had for him than the way that he had to go? But then it says, but, they, but, but Jonah says, I will pay my vows. I will offer to God the voice of thanksgiving. And immediately he was spun out. Immediately his deliverance came. Immediately he went to Nineveh. And immediately they repented. Come on. God began to show me these here things. He said, on the other side of gratitude is always the breakthrough. In Psalm 67, I believe it's verse number 5. I got it written down just in case, okay? It says this here. It, 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 it says this here. It said, let the people praise thee. Oh, God, let all the people praise thee. And if you look up the word praise there, it's the word that speaks of grateful offerings to God. 
It's the word thanksgiving to God. Come on. It's the most commonly translated word in the Hebrew that we have for the word praise. And it says, let all the people thank you. And then guess what happens? Look at the next thing over there. Okay, go to verse number four. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. So God says, let the people praise thee. And then what's going to happen? Then, then something's going to happen. Then the earth shall yield her increase. So the increase is on the other side of gratitude. I wonder how many times our personal finances are hindered because we're not thankful for what we have. But we complain about what we don't have. Or we compare ourselves to what others have. Or why does this person get the favor? Or why does that person get the favor? Is anybody getting anything out of this? And so you go through the whole Bible How many know Jesus, when he did his miracles, you don't see Jesus praying very often? Hello? That's very, uh, when I'm speaking of the miracles, you don't see him very praying very often. What Jesus did, though, is he commanded Lazarus to come forth. He spoke to the eyes. He spoke to the seed. He spoke to the tree. He spoke to the deafness. He spoke to it and commanded it. Why? Because he had the atmosphere sanctified when he went to Lazarus' tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. What was his prayer before? His prayer was, I thank you, Father, that you've heard me. The sanctification was already there. The atmosphere was already ripe. It was already ready and the deliverance came. I wonder how many are in the room today that are this far away from the then. I wonder how many in the room are this far away from a suddenly. I wonder how many in the room, the things that have been held up, that have been shut down inside of your life, in your mam- in your marriage, in your family. I wonder how close you are to a miracle breakthrough from heaven today by just making a minor adjustment of your attitude today into attitude of complaining and murmuring and half empty cup rather to a half full cup to a full God and a loving God that wants to make provision and breakthrough inside of our lives I wonder when Jesus of all the events that could have taken place the apostle Paul writes in the night in which he was betrayed of all the things he could have wrote about that Passover night in the night in which he was betrayed there can be no listen betrayal without first trust because betrayal in its conception means in violation of trust. When I trusted a babysitter with my son years and years ago, he's four or five years old, and he violated my trust and did wrong things and bad things to my child, that was a betrayal that took place and went to the full extent of the law to see justice. Can you all say amen? I say all that because the pain that it causes, the hurt that it causes, the violation that it causes to a young boy and, and, and to the parents. It's just, it was horrific. But I've also recognized, listen, God's word says in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he did something. He took bread. And we recognize this every time we break bread at communion. But the word bread literally means, and it goes back to the priest of the old, and it speaks about the bread of the covenant. And it literally speaks of bread of his presence or face to face with God. Did you know that every time you come to communion and you break bread, you literally are in the very presence of God, literally face to face with God himself? You literally come into the very presence of God and it's not the emblem, it's not the juice, but it's literally the faith that goes along behind it that you literally come face to face with God. And that's why the Bible says when you come together, let a man examine himself. Okay? And it says over there, it says because we have not, listen, because we have not examined ourselves and because we've released judgments, come on, Upon others, the Bible said, for this cause, many are sick, many are weak, and many are dying prematurely. Let me tell you, many marriages are sick, many marriages are weak, and many marriages are being broken up prematurely. 
because we have not discerned the Lord's body through gratitude eyes. Everything in my life today, I try by the grace of God to look through it through gratitude and see it in the opportunity that God has on the other side. But I recognize that when I get into the face of God, Jesus said that night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and he literally got into the face of his father. And the first thing that came out of his heart, think about that. Man, the betrayal that just took place, this is wrong. This is an injustice. This is painful. This is shameful. He's selling me out. And that very night, he took bread, and what did he do? The first thing that came out was thanksgiving. He gave thanks. And the Bible says as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do show the Lord's death till he comes. Not his resurrection, but his death till he comes. Because what I've recognized in there, to bring a sacrifice of gratitude is going to take an offering of faith in all of our parts. But what I've recognized is God says, let us offer therefore to him the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Because gratitude will sanctify the atmosphere for the purposes of God and for the family of God. Amen? Amen. What would happen What would happen today if every day we would take five minutes of our time to thank God for this church? What would happen every day if we would take five minutes and just thank God for pastors? Thank God for his wife. Thank God for his family. Thank God for his parents. Thank God for the musicians. Thank God. Come on. Every day. What would happen if we took on the time here, five minutes of our time a day, if we would take five minutes a day on the way even to church, and all we did was go back and forth, husband and wife, thanking God for our church, thanking God for the worship team, thanking God that they're going to be energized, thanking God they're going to be passionate, thanking God that pastor's going to have a word from heaven that's going to touch our heart, going to touch our home, going to touch our church. Come on now. And every day that actually went on, getting back to my opening remarks, for this cause, for this cause, I will that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will because everything is going well in your church right now. And I don't want to see it for this here May weekend in 2018, but I want to see it double. I want to see it increase, not with other church transplants, but brand new souls because we're coming into the time frame of history where the greatest harvest in Trenton is not yet to, it's yet to come. We're coming in for those loved ones and those prayers and those supplications and those intercessions and those giving of thanks that have been made for all men, for your loved ones, for your relatives, for the wayward sons, for the wayward daughters. It's time for them to come back into the kingdom of God. And let me close with this here. Many parents come to me after many years, and they say, what is it? What did you do to see all your kids? We got six married kids, and they're all tracking with God. Four of them are working with us right now. Our daughter works. Uh, our fifth one works in B.C., was working with us, but she's now in B.C. And they always ask us, what is it? What is the success of WCF? What is the success? I said, the success is we've gotten the values and the beliefs that Kathy and I believe down to the next generation because that's the greatest success you see young and you see old in the church and how many know listen carefully we see things differently but how many know we can all see christ the same way his love has never changed for one of us let's all stand to our feet i'm just sensing i'm just sensing that and in every time i've ministered this here there's different flows there's different ways that we can go into to close off the service. But I'm just sensing that there's individuals that are here today that you're stuck. You're just, in, you're, just, you're just stuck. And what was shared today is the antidote to get out of it. It's the medication, if you want to call it according to Proverbs chapter 4, 20 to 22. It's the word that will actually get you unstuck. But that betrayal hits your heart. And when it hits your heart, something just froze on the inside. I know what it's like. I was there 30-some years ago when I was betrayed. And I was there. And I, all I can say is I was just holding on to everything I knew on the horns of God's altar because my whole world was falling apart over 33 years ago. And my ex left, made some wrong choices, 
moved out, moved in with a friend. We'll leave it at that. And still with that person today, but we'll leave that for another time. I'm trying to raise three sons all on my own. I'm trying now to look for a job because I already had an insurrection that went on in the team. And it looked like the church was totally taken away from me, was ripped out of my hands. I had two of the leaders that partnered together to overthrow the entire leadership of the team. It was the most horrific, the most painful time that Rick Shimatero had ever experienced. But I remember my worship leader calling me up in the night that this was all going on because the next day there was 26 people that I had to answer before, including a Christian psychologist that the ex had been seeing, including people that were called in, pastors that were working on the whole situation. And I'll never forget that night that my worship leader called me up and he said, Pastor, he says, this is going on. The other guys, they're taking over the church. They've, they've tried to do this here, and it's all done. They already agreed. You're out. You're fired. You're getting, they're getting rid of you. And I just said, I said, buddy, there's only one problem with what you're telling me, but God. Can you say amen? amen. But God. And anyway, the whole situation was judged. I had stepped down. The whole situation was judged, and then it came out, the verdict And it all went in my favor. Can you all say amen? God turned the tide. But I recognized something that my attitude determined the outcome of what was going to happen. It was but God. And what I want you to do today, I want everybody to bow your head for just a moment. And if you're in the room today, it really doesn't matter your age or your nationality or the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you have or what you own. But you say, Rick, you know, I, I just understand today that my life got stuck from that betrayal. I'm not going to call you to the front, but I'm going to make a command over you, and I believe there's an authority that's going to break that off of you today. So if that's you, I want you just to slip your hand up. If you've just been stuck with that betrayal, I see that, I see that hand, I see those hands, I see the ones in the back, I see the ones in the middle. Is there any others? Everybody with your head bowed, I see that hand all the way in the back again. I need another one on the left, another one over there, another one. I see those hands. See that right over here? Okay, everybody, let's just do this. Join together. Join across the room. Join across the room. Okay, with all the ones across, you can go across the aisles. Just come on over, guys. Come on over. Let's all join together. And let's lift up one another's hands. And let's just say this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross of Jesus. And we thank you that everything the Son of God went through, he went through it for me. That I don't have to carry this. I don't have to be stuck in this. This betrayal any longer. This bitterness any longer. This unforgiveness any longer. Father, today, I release the situation of betrayal and frustration and hurt and shame to the cross today. Jesus, you paid for it. I now release them into your hands. I take my hand off it, and I give you thanks. I bring you an offering of gratitude. And I thank you that you started a good work in me, and you're going to complete it. I thank you for the life in this church, the life in my home, the life of God on the inside of me because I have a new commandment, a new name, a new honor, new friends, new family, and a new healer named Jesus for my damaged emotions. Okay, now, Father, restore the damaged emotions now. I command it in Jesus' name. Take out the infection. Take out, Father God, the roots And bring forth the health of God to spring forth to their minds. Release the balm of forgiveness by the grace of God to every hurt, to every betrayal, to all the shame. And Father, thank you that as your word says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And the context is the temptation to be unforgiving. So God, thank you today. You've led us to this church. Thank you today that our hearts are here, 
Thank you today that our hearts are for you and that our best days are ahead. And everybody said, amen. amen. Reach your hands out towards pastor. Come on, everybody reach your hands out and say, Father, we bless our man of God. We bless Camilla. We thank you for their marriage. We thank you for their example of faith. We thank you for their love and forgiveness. And we speak their best days are ahead of them. We thank you that the spirit of increase is upon them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. As I turn it over to him, the last thing I want to share is Psalm 100 says, enter. The beginning of your walk with God to that this afternoon, the beginning of your walk with God tomorrow morning will all be determined by how you enter. And the message Bible says, enter with the password. And the password is, thank you, God. Amen. Anybody ever forget the password? On your computer, you ever forgot your password? Man, nothing more frustrating than forgetting a password. Never forget God's password is very simple. Thank you. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, you look amazing. And you look a little lighter and a little skinnier than when you came in this morning. God bless you.